So the second part of your book is about the first uh, generation of Egyptian artists. You analyze the evolution of their careers and works. And you also explain the legacy they left to Egyptian modern art. Um, so I'd like to discuss uh, this uh, artistic legacy with you through some examples, uh, starting with George Hannah Sabah. Me, yes. Uh, you know, the first six chapters of the book and the conclusion discuss the socio-political context yeah. Yeah. of the emergence of fine arts. Then I selected six artists, one woman, five men, and each chapter is dedicated to that artist and acts as a mini monograph for yeah. this artist. I could have approached it differently and I could have talked about all of them at the same time and look at it in a much more critical way, what, this, what he did, what she did and so on. But after spending some time thinking, I decided to have individual chapter for each artist um, and analyzing his body of work or her body of work and how this uh, relates to the, to the context um, so that at least we have mini monographs for each artist, if you see what I mean, yeah, yeah. until further studies, deeper studies, um, individual books are dedicated to each of these artists. There is hardly anything available, um, and I'm talking uh, in English language, even the Arabic books, they are very difficult to find, if not um, impossible, you know. Um, George Hanna Sabah is a very good example of very li little literature available about him, uh, specifically by Egyptian scholars. In your book, you, you wrote, I mean, George Hanna Sabah was nicknamed the son of Egypt, who became the adopted child of France. So at the age of 19, he traveled to Paris to study in the studio of Lévy Dormer, and then at the Academy Ranson. And by 1930, he became a French citizen. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly, exactly. He, he went to France, he was sent to France by his family to study nothing, not art. He was going to study law and like many other uh, who's, who, who traveled, changed his mind, not changed his mind, but um, forced his father to accept his decision to study art. So that's number one. And when he moved to France, he only came back uh, about what, 15 years later to Egypt uh, when his mother passed away. So he spent a good 15 years not setting foot on the land of Egypt. Um, but it's important to say that throughout his life, he never denied his roots. And his back and forth trip between Egypt and France his adopted homeland yeah. and his native land, uh, this back and forth um, made him actually the product of none and the product of both, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Um, and even though he was watching the, the, uh, the 1919 revolution, the, women, the fight for women's rights, the fight for independence from afar, and he did not tackle these themes in his paintings really, he never did, um, he was still very, very Egyptian at heart. And that's why he said, the French call me uh, the Copt and the Pharaoh, and somehow this is, this is what I am and will remain. Um, and every time he used to come to Egypt, his oeuvre moved from the French landscape to become very Egyptian. And I don't know if you have this image, but this uh, painting, Le Grand Sphinx that he painted yeah, is very cool. telling. It's the more you look at it, you feel it's a self-portrait of George Sabah. And whenever he came to Egypt on formal assignments, he was a curator, uh, you know, he, yes, that's the so one on the left the hand side. Image. I loved it. I, it's a very uh, telling image. Uh, and the one on the right, how he depicts an ordinary uh, peasant family. Uh, both of them are actually, if you look, are extremely inspired by ancient Egyptian art. Of course, this one is very obvious because it's the Sphinx, yeah. mm. but uses 
uh, a lot of uh, cubism, so a, a non-Egyptian uh, style to tackle a theme that's very Egyptian. Uh, if you look at the one on the right, which is at the Mat'haf in Qatar, which is a stunning painting of the family, it's a very pyramidal composition uh, of uh, a very big family with lots of children. And the woman sitting on the floor is an image of many of his paintings where he basically tackles Virgin Mary and Jesus in different settings, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's, that's Hannah George Sabah, who is George Hannah Sabah, who was also fascinated by, by uh, the trees, by Aswan, by uh, Luxor. And unfortunately, it's very difficult to find those paintings. Uh, uh, we've tried to locate as much as possible some, and that's why I didn't put them in the book, but we have images of, uh, of paintings that depict Egypt, that's, that I, and I have them only in black and white, and one wonders where they are, you know? Yeah. And he was only introduced to the Egyptian public when he was 46 years old. Mm. Uh, Charles Terrasse was like the controller of fine arts back then, and he introduced him in, a, in something that used to be called El Diafa, which was like a club, something like a, you know, a cultural club where the uh, elite used to gather. Uh, and this is when he presented him to the Egyptian public. So these back and forth, as I said, played a positive and a negative role really. And an interesting thing is that there was a very good article written and it said, who is that George Sabah? Like who is that George, who is that Mahmoud Saeed in 2000? Yeah. And then, but that's, uh, that's Sabah really. Yeah. So you previously mentioned uh, Han and Nagy. So we have here two uh, paintings uh, of uh, the artist specific to what you call the Abyssinian period. So from 1932 to 1933, Mohammed uh, Nagy stayed in Abyssinia, which is now uh, Ethiopia, where he produced many paintings depicting the daily life and traditions of uh, of people. So my question is that why uh, Hamid Nagy decided to connect his own uh, to uh, this uh, African culture? That's the one million dollar question. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I'm very, I'm, I was very, yeah, I'm very curious to know, you, you specifically chose one year in the life of Muhammad yeah. Nagy, uh, which is very interesting out of his whole trajectory. So, uh, uh, and probably you're pinpointing to one of those transformative years of his life, to be honest. Uh, and we can see a, a rupture or a shift in his oeuvre and in his body of work, the before Ethiopia and the after. I will use the, the, the word Ethiopia, Ethiopia to make it uh, 20, you know, that is Abyssinia. Um, you know, Muhammad Nagy, as we mentioned, I think very early in our discussion, was from a very wealthy land-owning Alexandrian family. Um, extremely cultured uh, polyglot um, and um, multilingual. Uh, he read a lot about the ancient uh, Egyptian history and he became a diplomat. Uh, similar to others, his family was not very happy uh, when he decided to learn art and his father told him do whatever you want, but find yourself, you know, study something that will give you a decent job and an income. For them, art at that point in time, uh, contextually, was not that honorable, uh, yeah. you know, it was a new, a novel, a novel job. Um, you chose the Ethiopia period in 1932 and 1933, and it was upon his request that Nagy asked the Ministry of Foreign Affairs at the time uh, to send him to Ethiopia. And I think to answer that question, while there is no specific letter or uh, something that he wrote to explain why he chose that, we have to keep in mind that a few years before, and I tried to, uh, I think there is a picture in the book, uh, that the, the regent, Selassie, had visited Egypt a couple of years before, yeah. and maybe the fascination was there and the multi-layered heritage of, of Abyssinia at that time being Coptic and, and even the way the clothes, the way he was dressed, 
might have fascinated Muhammad Nagy to go and spend a year in Ethiopia. There are also a lot of political discussions uh, that I won't go into, in, into, um, in, into depth, but I think he was more fascinated about the history rather than the political context of Italy, Ethiopia, the, uh, oh. the, 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 the interwar between World War I and World War II. There was a lot of um, controversies and tension at that period. True. And Mohamed Negi chose to Ethiopia. So there might be a political reason as a diplomat. But from an artistic point of view, I think he was also fascinated by the history. And that's why this rupture happened. He became a freer artist. You suddenly see colors, you see spontaneity. He is not anymore that academic and formal artist of the period before that we see, for example, in his own Renaissance d'Egypte that shows Isis you know, leading the nation, which, we, which, uh, which he painted in 1919. Here you see a lot of spontaneity, a lot of vibrance in the color, um, a lot of freedom, really. Uh, yeah. He forego, he forewent, I'm sorry, he forewent a lot of the rules that he learned in Italy and France mm. with important artists that, that he studied with, you know. The sister of uh, Mohamed Nagy, if, if it, uh, Nagy, said about his brother that he believed that the role of art is to link the past and the present. So as you mentioned, uh, his, uh, his work uh, with the ISIS, uh, how did Mohammed Nagy include the rich uh, history of the pharaonic uh, ancient period in his artistic program? I love your uh, selection of uh, images, Arthur, honestly. Uh, you basically are selecting the the not the not sorry the, the crucial things and and your questions as well uh, you know the the painting this uh, stunning uh, painting of these two young girls sitting was uh, the other option for the cover of the book uh, oh. rather than uh, la pitastro voyage the yeah, mahmoud said yeah. that was actually one of uh, it, there were only two mahmoud said la pitastro voyage and this one and there's a whole uh, maybe a separate discussion, separate interview, why we went with that route and not that route. But to answer you, um, and, and that goes to, to how I introduced Mohammed Negi as a cultured uh, person who actually used to go and uh, uh, spend time in isolation in Upper Egypt, uh, similar to all of the artists of that generation, you know, um, and, the fascination with all these archaeological finds and spending time close to what he called his ancestors, he decided to, to become the, paint the national painter of Egypt. A national painter of Egypt in that context in the 30s and 40s meant glorifying the past, which differentiates Egyptians from the rest of the world. Nobody else has that civilization. And for him, uh, in the um, he wrote prolifically with his, to his sister, Aifat, who is 17 years younger than he is, and who is an, a fascinating artist in her own right, and she is one of the chapters in volume two. Um, he explained to, to Aifat that what differentiates him and Egyptian artists is how to be inspired and restore that glory again. And the number of uh, work, the, his body of work that get, is inspired by Egypt is very telling. I would say it's about 90% of his work, really. Um, the good example that you have on the left side is how he exhibited Egypt at the Pavillon Egyptien uh, at, at the exhibition, international exhibition in 1937 in Paris, you know? Um, a huge Isis, she's monumental. Yeah. And this has a lot of connotation, you know, uh, we can go in depth, but his selection, even though it's very to your face, to be honest, I mean, yeah. it's Isis standing, uh, you know, in the center of the huge painting. But what is next to Isis, that's how he combines the past with the present. Those six paintings on the sides are actually depictions of ordinary daily life. Yeah. It's women sitting, getting water. It is the men. Uh, with the musician men, these are everyday uh, events. So he basically combined the two 
in a stunning installation um, as the Pavillon d'Egypte. And what you see right in front of the ISS painting is the bust of who? Saad Zaghloun. By whom? By Mahmoud Mukhtar, yeah. who already had passed away, by the way. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I hope that answers your question. And there is ample, ample documentation through his letters in particular about how he was passionate about linking the past with the present mm -hmm. and becoming that national painter. Uh, he was very disappointed. And again, um, this is based on the letters he wrote to Eifat. And he questioned why, for example, his large uh, Renaissance d'Egypte, which was produced at the same time as Nahdet Masr of Mahmoud Mukhtar, did not uh, receive the same public display as Nahdet Masr did in a public inauguration attended by the king. Uh, his piece is now is part of the parliament, you know, the, the ISS painting yeah. when it, the ship is hanging at the parliament of Egypt and it was acquired by the government five years after he produced it, I think in 1924, to celebrate the first constitution of Egypt of 1923, but it did not get um, widely seen because it was not uh, publicly displayed. It's in the parliament, while Nahdet Masr of Mukhtar is a sculpture in the middle yeah. of the city at yeah. the Cairo. Yeah. So he was a bit jealous from that angle or a bit wondering why, no, not jealous is not the right word, of course, but he questioned that, mm. that the government should support paintings as much as they support sculptures. Sculptures, yeah. yeah. So another uh, artist that you worked on, Reda Ayad, who was one of the first uh, graduate students actually from the Egyptian uh, School of Fine Arts in 1911. He was also known to be against uh, the academic teaching in the establishment, saying, I quote, I was among the students who rebelled against the European academism. So he early detached himself from uh, Western classicism and Orientalism, yes. as you previously said, and he aimed to give authenticity to uh, his uh, painting. He liked to depict it peasant daily life and celebration. Uh, can you tell us why peasantry and the folk culture were used to symbolize the Egyptian authenticity? So in Rare Bayad's work, but also in also uh, Egyptian uh, modern artists' uh, work. Um, okay, Rare Bayad, we tackled down the sub both Sabah and Neki did not study at the Egyptian School of Fine Arts. So we've said that. And so you are now putting, uh, you are now uh, talking about Raghre Bayed, and from the three you selected so far, he's the first native Egyptian who has Egypt. graduated yeah. from the uh, from the Egypt l'école égyptienne des beaux arts. So that's very important to keep in context. He is also the first one of the first, and I have a nice magazine, first native Egyptian to have uh, traveled to Europe, Italy specifically, to continue formal studies abroad. Yeah. Okay. I love this cover because it's so yeah. telling. I don't know if you can see it, but yeah, Rabbi it is. standing and Muhammad Hassan, another artist, and of course Yusuf Kemel, another uh, I would say colleague of Rabbi Yed, who all uh, went and studied in Italy, um, and they paid from their own money at the beginning, which is another yes. uh, story. Rahe Bayet, similar to Negi, even though uh, artistically, stylistically are very different, but they were obsessed with building and creating an authentic Egyptian art. They were obsessed. And this is why uh, Rahe Bayet rebelled, even though he studied with foreign uh, uh, tutors in Egypt and then in Italy. When he came back, basically, he uh, wanted to uh, create his own individual language, uh, and he did so successfully, uh, to reach uh, uh, authenticity uh, and uh, building this Egyptian identity. Um, so so this is, uh, that's why I call him the godfather of the Egyptian gaze, yeah. because he was uh, basically uh, questioning Orientalists gazing at Egyptians and painting them and he wanted to change that. No, it's the Egyptian gazing at the Egyptian 
and translating what he sees into his own local authentic language. Okay. Um, now, unlike Nagy and Sabah, Raghav Ayeb comes from a more modest background and he was born in the village. Yeah. Uh, he was born in Menufeya, which is a governorate in the Delta. Um, he was francophone, but he was from a, a middle class. Yeah. And I think his exposure and growing up around the village uh, has left a, a significant influence in his art. That's number one. Number two, even though it's not blatant, but I think his choices of depicting this trilogy, trilogy what I call the trilogy of daily life, religious life, and the feasts, yeah. it, is that um, it was a social message. Uh, you know, we call them today socially engaged artists or uh, using art as a means for political resistance in our vocabulary today. His narrative was a bit different. He wanted to dignify Egyptians and to um, put uh, the ordinary people on, on the map rather than, you know, the king or yeah. the aristocrat. Uh, unlike Ahmed Sabri from his same generation, uh, who prolifically painted the wealthy people in a very academic way, Raghab Ayad went to the extreme, to the extreme, uh, and painted everyday life from the cow, from the market, from this woman. Oh, we have also. You have a, a very good painting. Yeah, that's, that's yours on the left side. Yes. Uh, and that's part of the, the different feasts. Um, the celebration of sitting on the horse, you know, and feasts that happen until today. Yeah. Okay. So this longevity is documented. And also the fact that Raghab Ayed was an Egyptian Copt, uh, it has a, 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 an immense value to our history because he documented, well, the, the painting on the right is, a, is an outside piece, you know, uh, you know, but, but Raghab Ayyad has a, a, a very a big a body of work that depicts life inside the church or inside the monastery, the lives of the monks, um, images that tell us a lot about what was happening in the 20s, 30s, 40s that have disappeared really. Um, and it's important to highlight that he, he was a, um, uh, one of the very first who uh, used uh, or who depicted religious uh, ceremonies or events or trivial day-to-day -day religious events in his art. Him and Marguerite Nachla, you know, I mean, so far you've uh, selected male artists, but I think uh, an artist, a female artist like Marguerite Nachla is also very important because women were, um, uh, or specifically Marguerite Nahla, another Egyptian cop, have played a very important role in documenting the religious side of uh, Coptic Egyptians. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, a... unfortunately for this conversation, I couldn't uh, select all of uh, these uh, artists that you are working on, but I have to mention that you also work on uh, Mahmoud Mukhtar and Marguerite uh, Nahla. Yeah. Yeah. Two... Yes. It's important to, to, to stress this, um, the affinity of Raghab Ayed with the, what we can call the marginal people or the ordinary people, you know, these are his people. And, um, and the interesting thing is that in his style, you can see a sense of humor uh, and the way he, uh, some might look at it as a caricature, you know, and very quick. Uh, he, he worked a lot on paper and you can see in his sketches and his works on paper that he's always in a hurry. It, to grasp that moment, to paint that uh, horse or that uh, wedding. Uh, but this has to do a lot, of, uh, that's why I call him a socially engaged artist. He was trying to say something on that, you know, uh, in this quest to Egyptianize and to differentiate from all these paintings that were abundant at that time from the classic wealthy uh, portrayals of, uh, you know, of, of, of the people um, in their palaces and so on. So yeah. anybody uh, from a Western centric point of view who writes that in the first generation, they had no affinity with the ordinary people, this is wrong. And that's important to highlight. All the artists, be it Negi or, or Rave Bayed, and I saw that you selected Mahmoud Saeed, another aristocrat, uh, have, have dedicated uh, 
we're engaged. Maybe you cannot see it so obvious, but when you dig, you have to contextualize. They were painting at the time of British colonialism and where people who saw art, the wealthy ones, could only see very, uh, very aristocratic portrayals. These people came and changed change the game you know mm -hmm. so it's important that i wanted to just hi highlight that how expressionistic and dynamic his paintings is just to create this authenticity of a moment and of course his sense of humor in my opinion i don't know if you would agree with me but i can yeah, i agree this. with uh it, it with you. And kindness, you know yeah oh. mm -hmm. okay uh, and then we have the great artist mahmoud saeed um, so as yeah, I said, he came from a, a very wealthy family. So you wrote in your book, Mahmoud Said admits to owing his joy and emotions to ancient Egyptian sculpture. Uh, so he also took inspiration from the ancient uh, Egyptian artist tradition. But how did he readapt uh, the Armana art uh, in his uh, painting? Mahmoud Saeed, yes, he is, uh, of course, he, uh, like Nagy uh, from Alexandria, like Nagy, um, he, um, he was working, he had a job, if you want, he was a judge, he studied law, uh, and like, Le like Nagy as well, um, he um, uh, was not uh, welcome to his family was not very much accepting that he becomes a painter. And he waited until his father passed away to resign, officially resign, and dedicate the rest of his life from 1947 to, till his death, 64, to become a, a painter. Mm -hmm. So that's also important. Uh, he also did not study at the Egyptian School of Fine Arts. So, so you can see a lot of uh, mixture here. You know, I, I like your choice uh, of, of uh, artists. Um, I did not invent the fact that he was influenced by the by ancient Egyptians. Yeah. Um, he, when he said uh, he owe, he owes his joys and emotions to ancient Egyptian sculptures, he was actually answering in an interview with an important uh, writer and artist and patron of the arts uh, called Jean Moscatelli, and uh, it was an interview that was published, which I found. And he answered him that if um, he basically said to quote um, uh, that basically the, those who those anonymous sculptors who painted in the mountains the grandiose temple of Abu Simbel may have well surpassed Michelangelo. So for him, he was uh, puzzled by uh, what he was seeing, obviously, uh, and he went uh, at a very young age to Lausanne and, and the Upper Egypt as well. Uh, again, it's this context of being, you know, flooded by those um, by those discoveries, you know, yeah. uh, and, and visiting them. And um, now, why specifically Amarna art, which you know, yeah. uh, ancient Egyptian art lasted four thousand years, and why specifically Amarna? And I and I purposely put those two side by side because the similarity is striking. True. Um, Very uh, true. You know, the receding forehead, the, the, the mouth, very uh, voluptuous, you know, the elongated eye, the long neck, look at this man. Uh, these are all characteristics of the royal family as depicted in Amarna art which is noticeably different from conventional ancient Egyptian art styles. Um, the features are very exaggerated. The, the, the features are very exaggerated. And you can see that in many of uh, Mahmoud Said's paintings. His protagonists look are made, uh, from Amarna. That's yours. <laughs> um, Le bain de, de chevaux à Rosette. And I think this goes back to the purpose of Mahmoud Said. He, his vision was to dignify ordinary people. Yeah. Again, an aristocrat who paints, of course, he had uh, a part of his earth was depicting portrait of his friends and his family, put that aside. But the majority of his body of work depicts, uh, I don't want to use the word, uh, depicts ordinary women, uh, peasants, uh, male and female, but in a utopian way, because none of these people really exist. 
which naked man is going to sit on his horse while he's uh, batting his horses? Your painting is a stunning example of this, what I call the happy island that Mahmoud Said uh, tried to depict. Uh, maybe had uh, had history could have changed had we achieved that happy island that we would be accepting and um, and and you know dignifying more the ordinary Egyptians. So why he chose that? Because maybe the Amarna period is the one that where uh, the pharaoh was painted in day-to-day -day activity. It was revolutionary to see the pharaoh uh, kissing his daughter, sitting um, nonchalantly with his wife. Of course, I'm using very easy language to make yeah, yeah. more anecdotal, uh, but um, be it uh, Akhnaton with his wife sitting in a family setting, it was revolutionary, you know? Uh, and it equal footing with his wife and his children. And I think beside the, 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 the the technical and the style of what I described, the elongated neck and so the beauty of it, it's magnificent. The Amarna period is magnificent in terms of art. I think he, Mahmoud Said chose that emotional, uh, ordinary sides. Suddenly, the ordinary man has become a pharaoh. I mean, I don't know if you've chosen other examples of painting, yeah, but the ordinary women dressed with a golden, uh, golden belt with beautiful blonde hair and her veil on, they are non-existent. Mm. That's not how they used to dress or, or up until today with yeah. her beautiful blue or red galabeya that doesn't exist. And a lot of gold jewelry, this naked woman sitting on a, on a boat in Alexandria who is an ordinary faleha mm. is non-existent. But that's the happy island he wanted to give them. He could not do anything about it, even though he was an aristocrat linked to the uh, to the king by family ties. Uh, and uh, you know, later on, maybe he, he was also a pretty socially engaged artist when he participated and exhibited with Art and Liberté, Art and Freedom, twice uh, to make a statement. And he made the statement that there should be equality, there should be dignity for ordinary Egyptians. Um, and I think that's, that's the purpose of my book was to try to actually tackle that important point to, to conclude is that even coming from very wealthy families, be it artists, political uh, politicians, uh, Islamic reformists, uh, women, women had a, a very active role. They all somehow, and I don't want to paint a utopian picture, of course there were problems, but they all united to build that new nation that was Egypt and to fight British colonialism in a context that was very difficult. Um, they put, they invested in funding this new school, in supporting and promoting La Société des Amis uh, des Beaux-Arts. Uh, Mahmoud Khalil uh, became a very big uh, art collector. We can argue that he was collecting French, primarily French art, but he supported the scene. Um, artists wore multiple hat, hats. They were educators, they were painters, they were um, art critiques. There was a unity to build that authentic Egyptian sovereign nation that Rifat Tahtawi wrote about when he said El Watan. And that was the concept that these men that you've selected and many women tried to, to build or create. Thank you so much, Patin. It was amazing well. to hear you speak. Congratulations for your book. And uh, we look you. forward for uh, the second uh, volume. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Au revoir.